Okay, Brecken's there. Time to get going. We'll look at some of the things you guys turned in this week, but we'll also review some things here in terms of making some meshes. We had the two main strategies we used last week for making meshes. We had our extrusion modeling and then our volume modeling. Right? Volume modeling, we're kind of able to smush things together. Extrusion modeling, we're taking a shape and we're pulling it out into the actual uh, shape. Right? Did you guys start Unity or Cinema 4D? Right, so I mean, just as a reminder, like that's been a really slow process for the past four weeks. I would launch the programs as well. That's what, I, that's what I'm waiting for usually here at the beginning. Like I said, hopefully these will get new RAM soon, and maybe that process will be faster, but who knows. All right, so this week we're making a, a shelf where we're going to make it more of an interactive thing than our just basic intro to 3D last week, and we're going to add a few more wrinkles to um, our strategies and tactics for creating... 3D objects um, that will drastically expand what we're able to, to put together, which will be great. Um, so in this instance here, what else do we want to make for our shelf? So one of the things we're going to be making, we're going to have like a bunch of shelves it's going to make sort of an interactive catalog this week. We'll take a look at that prototype here in a second. But one of the things we're going to put on the shelves is uh, like block letters of your name. Not my name, your name, right? So I'll do it with my name, but you should do it with your name. And this will allow us to explore a couple other techniques here. So uh, just me describing that, having your name on the shelf, that seems like more of an extrusion thing, right? You can type your name out and have that be a spline, and then extrude that spline. And so right here, as you may have guessed, the text object will give us, um, we can make text or a text spline. So look at the difference here. Text, if I select text, and give it a second. There we go. You see that it's already, um, already a three-dimensional mesh. Right, it's already a mesh here. Whereas if I make a text spline, it's just the spline that would be extruded in this case. Um, I'm going to use this one because it allows us to do uh, an extra step with this to make it look a little bit more interesting. And so I'll use the text spline for right now, and I've got this set up. And let's go ahead and put my name in there. And let's pick up. We're going to be making this three-dimensional, right? And so in that case, uh, a bigger, chunkier font is going to look better, at least make more sense, as these letters would be sitting on a shelf. And so here, I'm going to pick the Roboto Slab Extra Bold. There we go. That's nice and nice and thick. And then what type of object is going to turn this into a mesh? What did we use last week when we had a spline and we needed to turn it into a mesh? Extrude. extrude, right? And what color is the extrude object? Green. Green, right? Because it generates geometry based on some kind of input. And so what do I need to do here? Nothing's happening yet. Okay, I need to make the spline a child of the extrude. So if I click and hold, and there we go. The other thing to keep in mind with 3D uh, type is that without defining the edges of the type, sometimes it can be tough to uh, read. And so I have this that looks okay. I'm going to make the offset a little bit less, maybe 50, kind of like that. All right. 
And now let's add a new wrinkle here to this in that I'm going to grab a new object here that you want to put in your notes, sweep. Okay, sweep is similar to the extrude, but it takes two splines. One is the shape, basic to what, uh, analogous to what happens with the extrude spline. The second one is the shape that you're going to trace along the edge. It'll make more sense when you see it in practice. So I'll disassemble this for a second and I'll make a sweep. There we go. I'll take my text spline and I'll make it a child of the sweep. And then I'm going to grab one of my 2D what's. These are all primitives, right? Primitive 2D shapes. And I'm going to grab not the circle, I'm going to grab the end side. End side is just the n in this case is a variable, meaning that you can dial up or down the number of sides. And so I'm going to grab the n side. Usually if I'm going to make a circle, I, I use the n side a lot because it's more flexible than the circle, even if I'm going to make a circle. right? So I have this. It's really big um, compared to what I want to do with this. And so I'm going to dial it down to maybe uh, 10, like that. And now, still nothing's happening, right? because uh, we haven't established the correct hierarchy because uh, I did put the text in the sweep, but I need to put the end side in the sweep as well. And so I'll grab this one, make it a child of the sweep, and there we go. We can see, see how this is different than the extrude? It took the end side and used it to trace along the edge of the existing spline, right? Um, now you can see that there's some issues here, and in fact, I should really always be looking at the polygons, right? Polygons matter. What do I press to look at the polygons? And B. Very good. Cool. That's much better. All right. And the end side here, uh, one of the main parameters of this is the radius. And so you see as I dial it up and down, like there's a limit to how um, much we could do with this here if you get it too thick. This is just part of working with typography. Part of the complicated part of typography is uh, cornering, right? How do we handle the corners, not only in the design of the font, but now we're extruding it or sweeping it into this three-dimensional shape. So there's all sorts of issues, and they wouldn't be the same from font to font. So uh, I have this here, and the number of sides on the end gone or the end sides. And you see if I dial that up, I can get it to look like a circle because it gets very smooth. Or if I dial it down, you may have noticed that uh, one of the shapes missing from this list is a triangle, right? You're like, wait a minute, there's no triangle? That seems like a pretty basic shape. Because you could get to it with just the end sides. If you just typed in three, you would have a triangle there. Um, and so here you see how the end side gives you some flex, a lot of fl flexibility here, right? If I needed it to be a circle, I could just dial it up to probably about you know, 10 or so. If I needed it to be a square, I could just type in 4, and that gives me a square. If I needed it to be a triangle, I could type in 3, and that gives me that sort of shape. Cool. And we could combine these two techniques, right? This is cool, uh, but I'd like the center to be filled in, which is kind of what the extrude did, right? And so I'm going to show you a new object here. This is a really important concept just to uh, understand. An instance equals a smart copy, right? I could just copy and paste the text line and put it into the extrude, right? Allow me to demonstrate. Right? You're like, okay, I want to fill these in. You're like, okay, we just need to copy this and put it in there. So I control drag this to make another copy and I put it in there. And now I have both things happening. They're not really aligned how I would want, but you can see how I have both things, right? 
Um, the downside to doing it this way is that, uh, you know, let's say the client comes back and is like, okay, that's great, but that's not how the client spells Casey. They spell it K-A-S-I-E-E -E, in some sort of abomination of a spelling of that name. And so you would come in and type K-A-S-I-E-E, -E, and that would change one, but then you would need to come to the other one and change this one as well. If you used an instance, you, this would be unnecessary. So how do you make an instance? It's in here under, I can never see them when I'm looking for, there it is, instance, right? So you want to make sure you have the object that you want to instance selected, OK? This is one of those things where it's going to automatically make an instance of whatever is currently selected. And so I want to make sure the text spline is currently selected. I'll select, and I'll say instance. And now, check this out. I get text spline instance. You see the icon is different. The icons in Cinema 4D, I think, are pretty good as far as their visual design. If you look at them, they tell you something about how the object works. Look at the sweep. It's got the circle and then the line, right? Because a sweep would be good for making tubes, pipes, wires, hoses, all that kind of stuff um, would be sweep candidates. The instance is like a white cube and a green cube, the green one being the smart copy. Anyways, now I can just drag the instance down here. And it extrudes that. And if I change the original back they both change, right? You see how this is better? Especially, I mean, in this case, there's just two objects, right? So the overhead of retyping the word twice is not a deal breaker. But if you had a much more complicated, much larger hierarchy set up, then this would be uh, super useful in this instance. Are you with me there? Cool. All right, let's make this uppercase because I want it to be something that looks like it would sh sit on a shelf. There we go. You have to click outside of the field to get it to go. All right, great. So now I want, uh, I'm going to get rid of the end side and replace it with a rectangle and put this down there. Immediately everything blows up because the rectangle is way too big. And so let's dial down this rectangle quite a bunch. And you can see um, the other trick I'm using here is I'm holding down Alt when I dial this. And that uh, makes it dial into smaller subdivisions uh, of this number, not of the geometry. And so now you can see how I can use the sweep in combination with the extrude. Okay, there's a big empty space on this side here. So I need to take my extrude. And well, either two things. Let's go ahead and make the rectangle a little bit less there. You see, they don't quite line up exactly where I've got this empty space over here and I've got this um, over there. And so I may need to grab the sweep, the top level object, and just sort of move it back so that now I have a similar sort of setup on both sides grab the sweep, move it a little bit. There we go. Now I want a little bit more of a lip. I'm grabbing the rectangle and bumping that out a little bit. There we go. All right, so now I've got something that looks way more interesting. All right, I've got this outline. I've, these are two separate objects, so that means I could make them into separate meshes, which means I could give them individual materials in the uh, when I bring them over to Unity. The other thing we want to do here is one of our fundamental principles is that we want to have rounded corners, right? There's different ways to do the rounding of corners. We talked about the bevel before. Uh, let's try the bevel here with this object. Sometimes the bevel may be more successful or less successful depending on the way the geometry is set up. Right? So if I were to make a bevel, 
And how do I get the, the bevel's not doing anything yet. How do I get the bevel to work on the sweep? We could make it a child. It's better to group these two. What's the shortcut for grouping? Alt G. Yeah. It just, um, there we go. There we go. That rounds the corners. And then what have we been using as our default settings for the bevel? How many subdivisions do we want at least? Yeah, two or three is going to be fine, right? You don't want to have it. If you get to a point where you're looking at your mesh and you have NB on and parts of it look black because the polygon density is so thick, in general, that's bad. You know, we don't want to have that. You want to have more of a consistent um, distribution of polygons across the surface. And now you can even see in the quick render here in Cinema 4D how much better the edges look. Right? Allow me to draw your attention to this. Why am I making a big deal out of rounding the edges? Here's what it looks like without the bevel on. You see that no light is caught on the edges here. We do not get a highlight like you would learn about in painting class, right? When you have two objects and the light is coming from this direction, there would be a bright spot, a highlight over here, right? And that's not happening. Usually students identify this as looking kind of retro right in that it looks like kind of low budget or old 3d graphics the reason it looks old culturally is because it wasn't always possible to get these nice beveled edges on three-dimensional graphics right when this was first developed in the computer there wasn't the, the resources did not exist to bevel all the edges now we live in a time where beveling edges is just a matter of clicking the box and so we can click the box and now if i were to render we can get the nice highlights. See how much more readable everything becomes, right? Because we have this. And you can still make it look sharper if that looks too dull for whatever you're trying to achieve stylistically by just simply tightening up the offset parameter, okay? Where we can make it look sharper, but you still want there to be polygons on the edge. Right here, it's still sharp, uh, but now much still you know, interacting with the light looks way better. So let's review real quick. Important things. And as you did this project this past week in Cinema 4D, Cinema 4D, these objects can be used independently, right? We did some of this last week, right? Where we made the swing set primarily using the extrusion workflow, right? But then what did I do at the end? I dumped it in the volume to merge everything together. I combined the objects. For the most part, any Cinema 4D object can be combined with any other Cinema 4D object. So what you should be learning here is about the fundamental jobs that the individual objects do so that you can combine them, right? That vastly expands the amount of things you can make versus clicking along with me without really understanding what that object does. If you follow that route, you will only be able to make the things I show you how to make. If you understand how the objects work independently, then the sky's the limit, right? When you take things and you have like three or four objects that you know, and you start to thinking about all the combinations of just those three or four objects, well then that's, that's a vastly bigger possibility space than just combining them in one, one way. So independently um, execute objects. What, what new object did we just learn about? We learned about the instance object, right? Smart copy. Everybody understand that. This is what is what is the instance object in Unity? You guys already learned it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's a prefab, right? Where we make the blueprint for it and then if we change the blueprint, all of the copies change, right? Same concept. This is a fundamental idea 
in computers that when you replicate something in that's what computers do really well is that they do so they do a job many 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 times right the jobs instructions at scale that is the strength of the computer and so being able to leverage that uh, is key and then we got the sweep what I would write down about the sweep is that it needs two splines right you need one for the shape and one for the trace Cool. All right, so we've got something here. Let's be good custodians here and label these things. This extrude here will just will be the uh, inner type. This will be uh, the outer type. There we go. Got both of those labeled. Am I going to want to mush these together when I connect objects, or should I keep them separate? What would be the advantage or disadvantage of doing so? Thinking the whole way through our workflow. Just looking at this right here, when you start to apply a color to it, what are you thinking about how colors will be applied to this? Diana, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah, it's going to need to get imported into assets in Unity. But when you're looking at this, when you're going to color it in, should it all be one color? Or what would be more visually interesting? At least two different colors, right? So that we could have the outline be different than the inner part of the three-dimensional type, right? And so that would mean that we do not smoosh these objects together, OK? Um, and so in this case, I am going to uh, ba, 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 ba. I, I'm going to use what command do I use to turn it into a raw mesh? Connect objects, right? Everyone's got that one memorized, right? That is like a key, one of the key commands. Uh, so I'll go ahead and connect objects on this. Remember, don't use connect objects and delete because that would get rid of the original. We want, if we want the original so that we can go back and make changes right, at some later point in time. So there's inner type. I'm going to grab this one and connect objects. And there's outer type. Right? Something I do to, now, now I want to focus on these two okay, and not worry about these two, but I don't want to delete them. And so what I do usually is I group them, Alt-G, Alt-G. Alt, no, not pressing G, there we go. Uh, and this will be the original. And here in Cinema 4D, these two red, uh, these two circles, the top one is show in edit, show in render. We don't really care about rendering in Cinema 4D in this class because we're rendering in Unity, right? That's where. In, in Unity is where things get drawn onto the screen, right? So we don't really need to worry about that. But I just don't want to see them for now. Right now, I, they looks like one, but there's actually two because they're right on top of each other. Okay. Uh, and so I'm going to take the original and just make it unseeable by double clicking and making both of those things red. If the parent is red, that applies to all of the children. Okay. And so now, if I look at just the raw meshes I made, you'll see that they are the only ones there. The other ones are there, but they're just invisible because I made those red. Okay. Let's go ahead and save this file so I don't lose a bunch of my work. And I'm going to save project as in my Art 200 folder. And this will be block name. Object, quick save.
cool. And let's label these again. This is outer. This is inner. OK, now um, let's apply two more wrinkles to the workflow. Okay, There's two things that we want to acknowledge this week that I didn't acknowledge last week, right? Um, this stuff can be complicated, right? Uh, especially if you're not, if you haven't done any 3D before. And so I try to emphasize the most important principles and where I can keep it simple, I do. There's a few things. Uh, however, there's a balance there between simple and complex, right? Um, if you want things to be highly detailed, that also means that they're usually not super simple. Um, so here, there's two things we need to start thinking about. One is that all these 3D objects that we made last, this past week, we didn't really animate most of them. But we're going to want to do that in the future, right? And when we talk about animating, one of the first things we need to get right is the axis, right? Uh, before you set any keyframes, you need to make sure the axis is well um, is uh, well oriented, right? Otherwise, it just makes animating a uh, real pain. And the other one is a totally new concept called UV unwrapping. What does this have to do? Last week, we did take some textures, right? We, got, we grabbed a couple of things from Polyhaven, and some of you threw them on some of the different objects, right? And the other part of this is how does the 2D texture get applied to the 3D object? And so what you can think about here is wrapping Christmas presents. This is a good metaphor that everyone has some experience with, right? Um, if your Christmas presents is in a box, then this is not brain surgery, right? Usually it goes pretty well. Once you start dealing with some pretty irregularly shaped Christmas presents, well then we may have some issues, right? Um, and this is how you can think about UV unwrapping is going to be the plan for how um, the 2D texture gets wrapped around the 3D object. We're not going to go super in depth into this in this class. That's more of a 185 topic. Uh, but the good news is, Simmer 4D does provide a pretty good automatic unwrapping, which allows you to, for the most part, sidestep this topic, which can be a real hang up. OK, let's talk about the first thing, the axis. And so here, I'm going to go ahead and group these together. right? I'm not using connect objects. I'm just using group. Everybody understand the difference between those two things. right? When you group them, it makes a new parent null, and these two things become children. With the connect objects, it takes all of the procedural objects and essentially bakes them down into a raw mesh, two different procedures. Let's have both of these, whoops, grab both, alt G, there we go. This is my name block, there we go. And in here, um, we see where the anchor, if I click on name block, you see where the anchor point is. This isn't exactly ideal, right? If this is going to be a thing that looks like it's sitting on a shelf, ideally we want the anchor point to be on the bottom, in the middle, right? So this is something for 
most of the time when we're making 3D objects, not all the time, but most of the time, we're making stuff that goes in a room, right? Where it's like a, it's a chair or it's, you know, something that sits in, a, in some sort of space that has gravity, right? So that means like most of the stuff, most of it, has come to rest on some kind of surface. And so that means that the anchor point usually makes sense to be at the bottom of the bounding box of the object, meaning the if you took the object and you put it in a cube, what would that's the bounding box. Here I can demonstrate. Right here, the bounding box for this object would be something You know, about like that. In fact, I could grab the cube and I could say you should be see-through. There we go. Maybe more. There it is. Right about there. Okay, so that's a visualization of the bounding box of the object. Does that make sense, right? Because usually in a 3D game, this, something like this, is going to be the uh, hitbox for the object. Because just like in 2D, you don't want a super complicated shape to, for the computer to evaluate when it's trying to figure out like, wait, did this thing hit the other thing? You usually use much more simplified shapes. And so the bounding box of the object, uh, most of the time we want the anchor point for objects that sit in a room to be in the middle at the bottom. And so now we can arrange for such a thing here. I'm going to go ahead and come over to my asset browser. And there's a few things here that are going to help really, really help us out. And one of them is um, geometry. I think if we just type axis, it comes up. A-X-I-S. Yeah, there we go. And so this thing right here, this is a relatively new thing for Sim 40. It's a node operator. But we can use it kind of like the other objects, where we can drag it on to something. Right? So notice where the anchor point is now. If I drag this onto here, now we see it moved. But this geometry axis, if I go to inputs, this allows me to very easily control where the geometry axis is and we're essentially the anchor point of our object because now I can dial these, dial the axis in. I can move it the whole way to the side, to the other side. I can move it that way, this way, this way, right? And so here, I'm going to put it at 0 and 0 and 100. So x equals 0, y equals 100, z equals zero. These settings would be the ones that you would use 90% of the time for an object that sits on the floor. right? Because look where the axis is now for the inner part. It's at the bottom, and then it's exactly in the middle of the whole thing. I should be able to just control drag this one up here, and now both of them are exactly where we would want. So this saves us a lot of trouble. This geometry axis object uh, allows you to um, very easily adjust the axis point for what you have going on here. And now I'm going to save this object again. And what do I need to do? Is it ready to bring into Unity? What's that? Yep, I need to export it as an FBX file. So I'll grab the top level null here. File, export selected object as FBX. 
Let's see if that gives us an extra mm, uh, thing here for the geometry access or not. I don't think it will, but let's find out. And then um, make sure there's no cameras and lights. Okay. And we're in R200. Here's name block. Good. And let's check that out over here. Project. Go to mesh. And bring this object in. Here it is. And let's bring it in here. Cool. Let's look at what we got over here. Yes, cool. Those geometry modifiers do not result in another object down there. So that's nice and clean, and that is exactly what we want. All of our stuff looks good. We have two separate objects, so that allows us to do this, right? Now we can apply one to the outer inner color and another one to the other color, right? And so that allows us to very easily adjust this. And since it's at uh, anchor points at the bottom, it also means that it would scale from that anchor point. So you could adjust this here, make it as big or as small as you would want. Let's move this rock a little bit. Cool. Okay, so that geometry axis, let's add that to our knowledge base here, right? So in here, when we connect objects into a single mesh, connect to maintain separate hierarchy, right? We want to keep doing that, but we need to amend this. We go shift tab to go back, and we go and go use geometry axis node. And where do we find that? In the asset browser. Search for axis. And settings for objects that sit on, geez, cannot type the point, that sit on the floor. And that's going to be x equals 0%, y equals 100%. And Z equals zero percent. Let's move this over. Let's move this over because this menu is going to get. Jeez, there we go. Uh, export menu. This should really be a sub of that. There we go. And maybe this is all numbered instead. I have to do that for each one. Sure. Okay, let's continue our, our discussion of the axis because there's some important things we can do here. For instance, 
what is going to be the first opportunity for animation for the swing, right? What are you going to want to animate on a swing? Swinging back and forth, right? Not, I wasn't setting you guys up. Not a trick question, right? Swing. You, what do you do on a swing? You swing on a swing, right? Um, and if we look at our swing right now, and I select, we did a good job in that we separated it out into separate parts. And so this allows us to have some control over how things break down in Unity. That's good. But when I grab the swing part here, and I look at this, I'm like, OK, so what parameter should I be using to animate a swing? Is it going to be position, scale, or rotation, right? A swing rotates on the axis where it connects to the structure, right? And if we look at our swing here, if I hit uh, this, our, the way our swing is currently set up here, uh, this is no good. How about the swing chain? What's that? Yeah, let's not worry about the bending ropes right now. We just want it to go back and forth, right? Let's say that it's more of the, one of those, uh, let's say, super durable swings on the playground where instead of ropes they have steel bars that will not degrade over decades of uh, an unupgraded playground, right? Uh, having a rope is a much more complicated situation, right? It, when you start to think about each individual anchor point. We'll keep it simple. Okay, so let's, let's fix our swing with our new knowledge about the axis uh, center thing. So here we go. Let's come. Let's open up that file. I theoretically saved it. Let's see here. I may have saved it in a different location. Do is it, does it remember my recent files? There's one. Excellent. OK, here we go. Great. And so now um, we've got two things. We've got the swing chain. I'm going to rename it to swing bar, because now this is just a solid steel bar. Um, still swingable, but uh, you know, there's going to be no uh, play there. But where, first of all, we have two parts here. Right? We have this part. Uh, the swing set, this is the original, right? How do I make sure that I can't see it? What do I need to turn these dots to? Red, right? So you just double click on the dots and that, that turns them red. Cool. Because I don't want to delete that. You know, I wonder if I want to make any changes. And so here, um, the, we have two parts, the seat and the bar. Should we make any changes to the hierarchy? Should one of them be the child of the other? Yeah, you said seat should be a child of the bar? Yeah. Exactly, right? Because what's going to move in our chain of events here? The bar is going to animate. And you got to think, uh, you want to set up your hierarchy from the center of motion out, right? And so in a much more complicated situation, like an arm, right? the upper arm is going to be the parent of the lower arm. The lower arm is going to be the parent of the hand. The hand is going to be the parent of the fingers, so on and so forth. right? And so it moves from this way out, more or less. And so let's take the swing seat and make it a child of the bar. And now let's fix this bar anchor point with our new fun geometry axis object. I'll grab this put it over here on the bar. And with the bar, let's see. I was saying that we want to put the anchor point for the objects that sit on the floor at the bottom. But is that what I want in this case? No, I want it at the top, the other way, just like that. Now, this is the first time we're using a geometry axis in a more complicated hierarchy like this. And so in this case, we may need to move 
the swing back down to where it needs to go, right? So that's the seat. Now, with the correct anchor point, I'll move the bar back to where it goes. Now, I'm not going to animate in Cinema 4D, but I can test it out, right? I can grab the swing bar, press R for rotation, and there we go. Now I have these. I'm able, my animation is going to be easy peasy, right? It's just going to be a matter of animating one rotation parameter, right? Um, what if I wanted to separate these out so that I would have individual control over each of them? Again, a couple different ways to do that. Um, we're just going to delete the geometry, okay? So I'm going to go to the bar, and I'm going to go to point mode, okay? And essentially, I'm just going to delete one of them. I'm going to go to the box select, grab these, and hit delete. And then I'm going to go to the swing, and grab these, and hit delete. There we go. Let's go back. Okay, now I have one swing. Uh, let's look at the anchor, go back to object mode. Okay, I have one swing and the anchor point is in the right spot. Perfecto mundo, right? Um, e, I can move it over. How do I make a second swing now? Copy. Copy and paste. That's too much work. I just want to do it with one button. Control drag. Control drag, right? I'm just joking, right? If control C, control V is too much work for you, then like, I'm not sure what to say. But um, here, if I hold down control and let go, now it gives me a second swing. Awesome. And both swings, their anchor points are exactly what we would want. I could rotate one swing like this. I could rotate the other swing like that. Perfect. Cool. Let's look at the anchor point for the seat in case we wanted to do some secondary animation. Yeah, that's exactly where we wanted to. Excellent. See how that worked? Let's clean up the anchor points on the other objects, the frame. I'm going to go ahead and grab the geometry axis. And again, Let's do this, E, and then, um, yeah, I have the axis selected. I don't want that. I want the frame actually selected. I can move that back into place. There we go. And same thing, foundation, that's fine. Let's just line it up with the other stuff. Notice when I'm moving, I'm only mousing over one axis at a time. Okay, that's, that's a real key. I'm sure some of you ran into this over the weekend. Do not move in all three dimensions at one time. Why is this a limiting factor? Is it because Cinema 4D just did, can't handle it? No, it's because of reality, right? This screen, the one we're working on, how many dimensions is the screen? All the screens in this room. Two, right? It's just a flat thing. The 3D-ness of it is all a perspective illusion, right? We can't push stuff into the screen. And how many dimensions is the mouse? Two, right? Mouse only goes this way or this way. Right? And so again, the 3D-ness of it is, is just a perspective illusion. Um, you know, we'll do some uh, VR stuff later where we're actually able to grab things and move them around in 3D space, right? Um, but the mouse doesn't do that, at least not standard mice. They make some special mice where you can do this kind of thing and stuff. But they're not, you know, it's something that's just usual. So there we go. Um, you know, mouse over one dimension and move it straight in that direction. Makes it much 
much easier to take care of things. Let's grab the frame and the swings and move them down just a little bit so they sit into the foundation there. Let's double check our anchor points. Looks good, looks good, looks good, looks good. Cool, excellent. Let's re-export this thing. And so first, I'll come over here and a big one, save, I'm gonna go save incremental. This will make a new version of the file so that if some reason I don't need to go back and look at the old one, I'll have that one there. Once you start working on a, the same file for a long time, you want to save multiple versions for a couple reasons. One, if that file becomes corrupted and you just keep saving over it and the file gets corrupted and you can't open it, but you only have that one file, that's a problem. And that happens. That happens not often, but it definitely happens with Cinema 4D where like something goes wrong and the file gets corrupted and then I, the first thing I'm gonna to say to you is like, well, you have an older version, right? And unfortunately, in the past, students have said no, right? Which means, well, it's, you gotta do it the hard way, like by remaking everything. If you do save incremental, at least you have, chances are the previous increment was not corrupted. And so you can go back and at least pick up your work from that point, rather than having to start the work all over again. Big one here. So we're gonna go File, Save Incremental. Now, check this out up here. Now it's called Swing 0001, right? Swing, just swing.c4d is still on my computer, but Swing um, 0001, wherever I put Swing, Let's see where this is. File, so project as, I can put this in. No, it's in the 185 folder for some reason. Okay, it's in here. And let's do this. There we go. So you see, this is the original, right? The one I started with. And then here is the increment. If I do it one more time, watch what happens. File, save incremental. Then I go to look in the folder again. Look at that, okay? So the in general, this is not gonna be a problem for file size, right? We're not gonna be making gigantic Cinema 4D files, right? In fact, how big are these things? Like they're, it's less, it's less than two kilobytes, right, right now. It's not, not that big a deal. Um, and so having a series of increments to go back to, the other thing you can do to help your future self, right? Your future self is the one that's working on the project, the big final projects that we're doing at the end of the semester. That's envision, envision that being you in the future, right? Your future self. And in some sort of like time travel movie, you burst through a portal and you tell your future self, be sure to save incremental, right? Because that future self may be about to get a corrupted file. And if you can educate that future self now, you're essentially saving yourself from that calamity in the future, right? The other thing you can do to save your future self is come into edit projects, set, or sorry, edit preferences, and make sure under, under files, make sure you have autosave turned on. This is another version of incrementing, and you don't even need to think about it. Again, this is what computers do great, right? You tell the computer to execute some instructions on a given schedule, and it's just gonna keep doing it until it runs out of electricity. And here, this is another insurance policy that you can have against losing your work. Both of those things. Cool, all right, we got that. So that's our originals. Let's go ahead and export. Make sure you select the top level and we'll go and file export selected file as FBX. Okay. We'll call this swing mesh anchor fix. So I have save. 
Uh, it gave me that <coughs> error last time. I don't know what's going on there. But I believe it saved it. Let's try and bring it into Unity now. And so let's get rid of our previous swing set. Just get, there we go. delete that one. There we go. And let's bring in our new swing set with our corrected anchor points. I don't think it exported. Let's do this one more time. File, export selected object as FBX. OK. 200 folders. OK, there it is right there. There it is. OK, cool. So now if I bring this in, go. Looks good. Looks a little small. How should I correct this issue? Should I just scale it? Ideally, no, right? I want to change the default size for it. So I'm going to grab the, the actual asset and go to model and turn the scale factor to 2. So that'll be the default size. It'll be twice as big. That's too big. How about 1.3? Apply that. There we go. And now I have a good default size. And I can move this to where I want it. And now if I unfold over here, both of my swings have the anchor point in the exact right place. If it doesn't look like it's in the right place, you're like, I just did it in Cinema 4D, it looked good. It is because of this in Unity, right? Did anyone run into this over the weekend? In Unity, there's two different ways to view the anchor point. One is pivot. Pivot is the way, is the anchor point you just set in Cinema 4D. Center ignores all the work we just did and just puts it in the center of the object, right? Which, not, not great. And so we almost always want it in pivot. Cool. Let's animate these swings. I'm going to create a new animation folder. I'm going to grab one of the swings here. I'm going to come over to animation and say create. And I'll call this swing. There we go. And now I'll go ahead and Turn on a keyframe. Which one are we going to need? We're just going to need rotation on the Z axis. There we go. And so at first, um, maybe I want it to start off you know, this way. And then let's make it a round number so it's easy. Let's say negative 50. There we go. And then we want it to start at negative 50. So move the playhead back here. Let's say it's negative 50. There we go. Move the playhead forward. And then it needs to swing the other way. So 50. There we go. And then we need to make sure that we always get back to the original spot. In this case, we also want to make sure the timing is fairly even. You don't want it to swing one way faster than it swings the other way. That would be kind of weird. And so let's see. There we go. It doesn't really look like it's swinging very much because of the curves. Let's adjust the curves. So we'll go into the curves. I'll grab the Z rotation, which is the one we just worked on. I'll press H or F so I can see the curves and expand this to see them. And in this case, I need to expand these handles. And so I'm going to grab all of them. I don't know if there's a way to make this the default. Maybe there is, I'll have to look it up. In most cases, when I'm animating in Unity, 
I'm setting my tangents to weighted, okay? Weighted gives you the behavior that you're used to in After Effects and Cinema 4D that allows you to not only curve the Bezier handles, but then pull them out to change the length of the curve. And so let's do that. Both tangents to weighted. And so now I can drag these curves out to increase the amount of time that the swing is hanging at the apex of the swing curve. Now I want it to look balanced, so I don't want to get these two messed up. There we go. All right, so it looks like about the same on each side. Let's look at that. Yeah, definitely not balanced. Move this one over. Put this one at 50. There we go. And let's make these a little, a little less. That may have been a bit aggressive on the curvature. Now here, I moved one of the keyframes, but we want them all to be the same length. I may go back to the other view here. Right, see how the part of it, the reason it's hanging there longer is because it has this extra space. And so in these here, I'm just gonna move these so they line up. And that should, there we go. I don't think we can get rid of them. Once we slow that down, I think that's going to be all right. And so let's come over here to the animator, swing, speed, maybe 0.3, and see what that looks like when we swing now. Cool. The swinging motion looks good. Um, There's something weird going on. What's weird? The swing is not rotating with the rest of the platform. Exactly right. Why is that? Exactly. Both of these things need to be a child of the playground so that when the playground moves, they also move. Cool. Um, let's see, I believe since we just animated rotation on the swing, we come to the swing here, right, as the animator. I'm going to right click and say copy component, and then go to the unanimated swing. Right click and say paste component as new, and that will copy the component and the swinging. And I believe both of them should swing now. That's better. I want them to swing differently. What's the best way to solve that problem? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we could get in here and, and adjust the keyframes so that they're not the same, right? Although, that's not going to be as simple of a solution because they're both, look at this, we didn't create, we applied the component to both objects, right? But that component is reading the same animation clip, the swing clip, right? And so if we wanted them to swing differently, they would have to have separate clips. In this case, 
I'm going to use the script that was developed exactly for this purpose. And so did I already put it in our project? I don't think I did. This is not those scripts yet. Let's come back and grab it off of our script database. And so Well, it's already on the computer. I think it's in our other project. So I'm just looking in my other folder. Nope, I didn't grab that one. So we'll grab it off our database. Right here, you're up here at the top, important Unity scripts. Animation speed. Do we use this one? I thought we used it once already. Yes. Okay, good. Right? And so again, this one allows you to just vary animation speed between objects using the same clip, right? So we don't need to go through the rigmarole of making, because what what Jose suggested is perfectly valid, right? Just change the keyframe so the other swing is different. That's a totally legit solution. It falls apart when you scale it, right? Where like the client comes back and says like, great, um, we really like the swings. We want 100 swings, and we want them all to swing differently. And then you're like, hmm. OK, so I need to animate 100 swings differently. Like that, that's going to be a, a lot of work, right? Um, the animation speed script here does it by taking the same clip and playing that clip back at different speeds. So let's go ahead and grab it. We'll grab the animation speed script. I did already download it at some point here, which is why it came in with that dot one. And so let's, here it is. Make sure I import either delete the dot one or import the one without the one in the parentheses. Let's drag it into our Farina folder here, the folder with your name. And let's also make a note of what speed I made the swing swing so that I have a relative range for how fast I want these to go. I don't know why Unity does this every once in a while. It's sort of re. Oh, I brought in a new script, so now it's looking at a bunch of other ones. There we go. All right, so now I have this script here. And again, the thing to know about the animation speed script is it must go on object with animator. Okay? You can't. Um, I can't just put it on the top level here, I need to put it on the object that actually has the animator on it. And so here, there's the animator. I'll drag the script onto there. Let's look at how fast we're swinging. 0.3. And so I'm going to say my minimum random speed is going to be 0.2. And my maximum random speed is going to be 0.4, right? And so now, every time the program starts, it's going to pick a random playback speed for the swing somewhere between 0.2 and 0.4. And if I do that for the other one as well, they'll be different, 0.2 and 0.4. Now, let's play it back. We get different speeds for both of them. That seems very slow. Let's see here. Am I multiplying it by this? 
I don't think I was, but let's check it out. I don't think that should affect it if I change that number. Although it's been a while since I wrote that code. Ah, it does. Okay, so it's relative. Instant. Interesting. Okay, so now this everyone agrees, okay, this looks way better, right? In that they're not both moving the same, which is kind of weird for swings. There's still no one on them, but whatever. Um, but now this solution scales, right? If I want to make more swings when the client comes back and says, like, we want a thousand swings, right? Then it's just a matter of, you know, prefabbing this swing. And now, if I were to bring in more swings, since they all have that animation speed script on them, they're all going to animate differently, just as a matter of demonstration. So a super efficient way to create this sort of variability, right? Make sense? This is super important for world building, right? If you know you get into the world, whatever the world is, and you have a blinking light, and all the world, all the lights in the world blink at the same speed, it just it isn't how things usually work out, right? The the to actually have such a thing happen in the real world would be uh, actually fairly difficult um, without having them drift or you know, a whole bunch of other issues. But animation speed script to the rescue. Everyone got a handle on what this one does? Pretty much any time you have an animated prefab, you're going to want to have the animation speed script on there. Because that means you'll be able to immediately have both. You get to have your cake and eat it too. Because you get to use the prefab system, which makes smart copies of everything. But you're able to use the speed script to create variation in your animation. Let's add some materials to our swing just like we did before, if I come in here. Um, there we go. It's a playground. We're going to say that this playground was built, it's going to be a She-Hulk branded playground. That's why we got uh, green and purple here, right? Look like we got a, a grant from Disney Plus to make a She-Hulk branded playground. Or Hulk branded playground, really, it's the same colors. But he doesn't have his own TV show, so there you go. All right, so I think a pretty great example of how that geometry axis is super important. In one, easy to use. Two, great for being able to animate things here in a way that's going to be really, really well done, right? Okay, what was the other thing I was telling you about? UV unwrapping. Allow me to demonstrate the concept a little bit about how a material may be applied to geometry. We'll use something like this for now. I'm going to make a material in here. So 
so we can see what's going on. There we go. And we see what's happening here. The blocks kind of get bunched up at the north pole and south pole of this capsule, and they wrap around. This is kind of, you know, if, you ha if I gave you a giant capsule that I told you to wrap for someone's Christmas present, this might be one way that you would go about it, about it right? However, there's other ways. Um, you can sort of see them here if you uh, select the tag and under projection. This would show you some different options for how this two-dimensional texture would be applied to the three-dimensional object, right? Cubic. This is as if you're projecting it from all six sides of a cube onto this rounded geometry, right? And so the the Christmas present metaphor here would be like, I gave you this cube, you cut out six squares, and then wrapped each one of those, taped them together around the outside of this giant capsule. Um, you see, that, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense for this shape. But if the shape was an actual cube, right, then that would make a lot of sense, right, in that uh, it's not going to look different from here, but, you know. Then having six squares and taping them together around the outside. It's not usually how we do Christmas presents, but it makes sense in terms of you know, how to approach the problem here. Does this make sense now? What I want you to get from this right now is that understanding that there are different ways, different methods for wrapping a 2D texture around a 3D object, okay? There's not, the thing about 3D uh, UV unwrapping, which is what this process is, is that there are different ways to do it. They result in different levels of distortion. A lot of it would change depending on what the texture is and how you want it to repeat over the surface of the object, so on and so forth, right? There's a lot to say about this. In 185, we essentially spend the whole semester talking about it to some, for some extent. Um, but allow me to show you how this is affecting what we're doing. Back in Unity, I glossed over this last week so that we can make something, right? This is how I teach stuff, is that I think it's much more interesting to make something than not make something. And if we have to obfuscate some of the complexity in order to make something, then we'll do that. But if we uh, look closer at our rocks that we made, for instance, right? if I grab this rock here and I adjusted the rock texture so that maybe it was a little bit stronger, we could start to see how we ended up with some undesirable stuff here, right? For instance, when I turned up the normal map so that it looked really bumpy here, that looks you know, consistent, like how it lines up with the shape. But as I start to look around the rock, you see that I get these areas, especially on top of the rock, where everything clearly got distorted, right? Because this rock is a fairly irregular shape, right? If I gave you this rock and told you to wrap it up for someone's Christmas present, like this would be a much more complicated day of trying to figure out how to wrap this thing up, right? Um, it's not a box, it's not a cube, right? It's going to be, uh, there's, there's going to be a lot more decisions that you have to make about how to approach this problem. Everybody with me? Okay. So this we can address with another geometry node, just like we did with the axis issue. So if we come in back here, let's, let's pull up this rock from last week. I don't see it. I think I need to find it. I think I probably saved it in the 185 folder by accident.
Okay, here's our rocks. We have them as a mesh here. And so what we need to do to address this is fix the UV unwrapping for it. Uh, you can examine this in the UV edit view, and we'll just look at it just uh, as a example here. And with, if I select the rocks and go to polygon mode, you can see that this is how things are laid out here in the two-dimensional view. This is not great um, for a variety of reasons, but we don't need to get into that. We can address this issue with that automatic UV unwrapping. And so if I come over to here and I look for UV, um, I think if I just type auto, there we go, right here. Right, so this automatic UV unwrapping node, which I can apply in the exact same way, like this, right? And there we go. I don't think it's going to show up here. It does not. Um, but that doesn't matter because we're not really going to uh, inspect it. We're just going to look. And we'll look here. I'll go ahead and um, I'm going to export this object again. I'll go ahead and say export selected object as FBX. We are going to put it in the right folder this time. And I'll call this rocks UV. Now that it has UV, right? And I'll click Save. And I'm going to make a new file here and bring in that rock so you can just see what's going on. OK, there we go. And B, the rock geometry is unchanged, right? Looks the same. If I come over to the UV edit on our rocks, aha! Look at this. Looks substantially different from this, right? Now, um, just like I said with the volume measure and volume builder, right? without even getting into the intricacies of it, just looking at these two things side by side, you can, just as a human being who appreciates order over chaos, you can see that like, oh, okay, this at least seems more organized than this, which is like a bunch of lines all jammed together. It's hard to tell exactly what's going on. Here versus here versus here versus here. Make sense? So. The manifestation of this is simply applying the automatic UV geometry node to the mesh. Okay? This is, a, this is super important for meshes where you're going to apply some sort of texture. Right? Why, why didn't we do this for the swing set? Well, for the swing set, I wasn't putting a pattern on the swings or the swing set, right? We were just making it like green or blue or whatever, right? Um, and it doesn't quite, it doesn't really matter as much in those instances. But here, when I want to put a texture on this, it matters a lot. Let's see how this plays out here in um, Unity. So we'll go back to the mesh, come back over here. We'll grab rocks UV so that we can A, B test it with uh, rocks. And here's Rock's UV. Why is this at a weird angle? I think I'm just looking at it strangely. There we go. And bring this over here. Bring this down a little bit. Cool. And let's apply the same texture to see the difference here. And you'll see that we have fixed some of our problems. There's still a few things here. But now, this like weird stretchy distortion that was happening at the top of our rocks, no longer there, right? The material seems to be much more evenly spread across the surface of the object. Now, we get like an obvious seam that's happening here. 
we can adjust for that in different ways. But we're going to want to do this, right? So when do you use the automatic UV? For any object where you're going to want to apply a natural texture in Unity. Everything's still going okay on the live stream? You guys can hear me? Now that we at least have good UVs, let's um, fix this to the next level. So for instance, we're going to go back. And we do have something that's going to help us with this. Down here at the bottom, we're going to import a, our, four, our first shader. OK, what's a shader? Equals, um, you can think about a code that runs on a material. It's different from the code that runs on a script. The, the code that runs on a script has to do with your game function, right? What happens when this thing hits that thing, that kind of stuff. The shader is code that has to do specifically with the rendering. Um, how does do, do the different things get rendered? And that kind of code is written in a fundamentally different way. OK, so right here, try planar shader. I'm going to download that. And we're going to look at how to set that up. This one's uh, super important in that um, while correctly exporting UVs did fix a lot of the distortion, distortion, we still get some of these seams here, right? The seams are a result of those. UV islands that got made, but we can still fix that. Uh, I'm going to go to my two materials. I'm going to drag in the thing I just downloaded, the shader. Right? It says tri planar shader, shader graph. Shader graph is a way to write shaders. And if we drag this in, it should come in and look like uh, this. It has a little um, thing on it. Ba, 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 ba. There we go. Looks like this. How do I use this? You need to put you need to put a shader on a material. So I'll make a new material here. Create new material. There we go. Um, and I'm going to call this uh, even rocks. 
because that's what the triplanar shading is going to do. It's going to, those seams that we got, it's going to get rid of that. And so here, with even rocks, um, I've got this selected. And up here, at the very top, we haven't messed with this up until now. Under shader, this is where you can switch to switch the shader that's running that specific material. And if you click on this drop down now, you go down to shader graphs. Once you've imported the triplanar shader, it'll show up there under shader graphs. And so you can select that one. So go to shader graphs, triplanar shader. And you see that your options here change. Um, but let's go ahead and use it. So I'm going to make another instance of rocks so that we can clearly see the difference here. So I'll go back to mesh and drag another rock in here. Actually, we want the UV one. So there we go. All right there. Great. And then back to materials, um, even rocks. Here we go. And it looks like we have two spots to add a map, the color map and the normal map. Let's use the same ones that we already have. And so that's going to be in our textures. And so I'll bring in the color map and put it here. And bring in the normal map and put it here. There we go. Uh, you should be able to adjust Yeah, the normal strength is here. You still have your smoothness, I'm just kind of like in a different spot. And uh, if you want it to look metallic or not, there we go. And so now you can go to materials and drag in even rocks. And look at that. Look at it. Look. It's so beautiful. The texture is evenly applied across the entire surface of the object. We don't have any of the weirdo stretching that we got with an un-UV unwrapped object. And then even with the UV unwrapped object, we've managed to not have the seams because now we combine the proper UV unwrapping with the triplanar shading. And so now, this is, e, you know, by far, the best looking of the three. Does this make sense for everybody? Right? So how do we make things look good? One, you make sure you add the auto UV unwrap. And then two, you want to use the only for things where you're going to apply texture. If using a texture, then you go ahead and apply the triplanar shader. Makes it nice and even across the surface of the object. Let's grab another material. Where did we get our materials before? Some of the ones that we used? What was the website? Yeah. Let's grab something else to test it out. Let's grab some other rock material. We'll try this one. And then which which maps did we download? Diffuse. Yeah, diffuse is just going to be the color. And let's grab the PNG. 2K is going to be plenty of Ks for us, right? What does the K stand for? Thousand, 2,000, 2,000 pixels. Save image as. And then what was the other one that we want to grab? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, the normal, right? What does the normal do? Gives it the bumpiness, right? We'll apply them one at a time here. So I'll go ahead and save this one, save it in the jazz. Normal maps are always going to look blue like this. And so we need to set up a new material. Create new material. We'll call this uh, rock two. In rock two, I need to change the shader. Shader graphs, triplanar, there we go. And now I need to bring in my new textures that I downloaded. Grab both of these and drag them in. Let's see if it prompts you when you're using the shader graph to change this or not. Um, so now I come back to my materials and go to rock two. There we go. Go back to textures. We'll drag the diffuse into the base map here. That's good. And then I'll drag the normal into here. Okay, it doesn't prompt me. So with the normal map here, I need to select it in the assets. And you need to tell it that it is a normal map. It makes it calculate differently. And so I need to say, this isn't, uh, this isn't a regular texture. It's a normal map. And hit apply. There we go. Now if I come back to my materials, let's uh, make another copy of this. And we'll apply rock 2 now to that one. Awesome. No seams. Nice and even for the most part. Pretty good. Yeah. Let's see how this works out on our typography. What if I put the even rocks in the middle and rock two on the edge? Pretty good. Now, if you remember correctly, this one was not UV unwrapped. For the most part, it looks okay. Sometimes triplanar shading are gonna work, is gonna work all right, depending on how it breaks down. Do we still have a tiling here? Yeah, there's still a tiling on this where you can adjust the density of you know how spread out is the texture across the surface of the object. I feel like there should be maybe a br oh, larger number to apply there. Cool. Get have it kind of look like it's coming out of the rocks. This could help us out with our trees as well. So in here, let's come back and examine a tree workflow again. So before we, uh, what, what, were, what were the objects that we used to make all the trunk mesh together into one thing and make all the leaves mesh together? Volume Builder and Volume Mesher, right? So I know I'm going to be using that workflow here. So I'm going to get both of those things on the board. Right, so put the, the builder inside the mesher. That's how that has to go. And then um, I kind of want some more control over this. 
versus just sort of like, here's a cylinder for my tree. Trees are often less precise, right? They don't stick straight up out of the ground. Um, so I'm going to go to the front view here. And I'm going to come over here to my spline tools and grab one that says sketch. This allows me to just freehand draw a spline. I'm going to turn on smoothing and just sort of do something like that, right? So I'm able to draw this line. And the cool thing about splines, we've used them to extrude, or what was the other one we just learned today? Instead of extruding, we trace something along. What was that called? Sweeping. I was sweeping. How about it this one? It looks like you're trying to hit a golf club or a golf ball. Well, it depends what kind of broom you'll like be using, right? Am I, am I using a push broom or are I using, I mean, what's the other kind of broom called? Just a broom, right? Yeah, swing broom. No one calls it a swing broom. That's not a name. I don't, okay. Um, anyways, here's the spline. Uh, we used a sweep and extrude earlier, but you can also use splines in the volume. Check this out. Boom. It takes it and turns it into geometry, which is super interesting. If you check the volume builder, there's also some pretty interesting parameters in here once you put a spline in. If you select the spline itself in, okay, so I have the volume builder selected. This is where all the action happens, right? There's not too many things to adjust in the volume measure. The volume builder is where you got the real action. Uh, we have our voxel size, right, which allows it to be more or less detail, but kind of right where we are right now is good. And then if I select the spline, you see that there is a function graph here, which is really interesting, and a radius. So the radius allows you to make, because all I did was draw a line, right? And so th one of the first questions you have to ask yourself is like, I want to turn that line into a three-dimensional volume well, how thick should it be? And so the radius here allows me to dial that in or out. And then this uh, function graph right here allows me to actually change the radius over the course of the spline. And so if I were to grab one end and bring it down, now I can taper this, this thing I have right here. If I come back to the spline, object, select the spline, it's all still live. So remember, if I come in, if I grab any points in a spline, I could grab points and adjust them to move things around if I wanted. Um, I could even maybe grab some of the points and you know, like rotate them to give it a little bit of a, I want to grab more points than that, let's say. Oops. Let's grab these points and rotate, and then maybe move over a little bit, give it kind of an angle. See how this gets real interesting, real fast here? Right, and so now, let's say I want uh, a branch coming off of this thing. I can come in here. If I select this spline, and I go back to my sketch tool, I can draw another one. And you'll see I still have one spline object because it added it to that spline and everything gets calculated on the way up. And so now I've got a branch branching off of that. Now drawing things on a 90 degree angle is pretty easy. Once you want to start branching off, it's going to require moving some splines around but we can do it. So like over here, if I came in and again, with the spline selected, drew something else like that. Um, that one again branches off there. I could select that ob this one spline here, these, and uh, grab the select tool, just grab those points.
can rotate, maybe move this a little bit, rotate, right? And sort of set up a much more organic looking tree. In the spline, um, all of these, there's a good one here where you have scale per segment. I believe that's going to give us more of what we want. Yeah, so now you see that this allows you to, so it's a bounce between the total radius and then this scaling per segment sort of make this much more, if I wanted this just to be fatter down here, I could frankly just add another spline, right? Because we're just kind of mushing shapes together here. Right, so I came in and make sure I have this selected, make sure I have this selected, and draw another, there we go. And that sort of just makes that part a little bit fatter. Maybe over here, you could do the same. And then we have a, this is okay. It's a little chunky. Two things to do. Maybe the voxel size comes down a little bit to get a little bit more detail. And then another one we, I think we used last time. If we click this button, it does exactly what it says. It smooths out the mesh that we have. And so I'll click this button. You see it makes us smooth. And sometimes it just totally goes away because the smooth strength is too strong. So if you dial this down, you see things will come back. And it has done quite a bit to smooth out the mesh. What object are we going to put at the top of this hierarchy to clean up the topology? Yes. Almost every time you're using the volume builder, you're going to want to put that remesh at the top. Give that a second. Ah, right? Doesn't that just feel better? Right? Ah. Ah. Right? See how th this, is, this is essentially what 3D modeling comes down to, is topology follows the shape. That's kind of what all these tools are designed to do, is that we want the way that the polygons are laid out on the surface of the object to follow the shape of the object. When that's the case, it makes all of the rest of your job much, much, much easier. When, topo when the topology doesn't seem to line up with the actual flow and shape of the object, it's a much, it becomes much more difficult. Cool. That looks pretty good. Let's make some um, bunches of stuff over here. And so instead of using the, I'm going to go ahead and grab one of the platonics here to use as like a fundamental shape. I'm going to hit C on it so that uh, I can go into mode here and just start to distort it. T and doing these kind of things. Let's move it over here. T and then E, control drag, R, rotate, E, control drag, R, rotate. Just moving it around, real sort of freestyle. Looks very, very, very blocky. Not really what I'm after. And so Let's fix this problem. I don't want this to be the same as the tree, right? I want it to be different from the tree. So I need to make some separate, I need to save my file first, what I need to do. Save project as, and 200. This is volume tree with splines. There we go. And let's go ahead and give ourselves the volume measure, volume builder set up our hierarchy, put all this stuff inside our builder. There we go. 
in our builder. I want this to be smoother, so boom, I hit the smooth button. That goes well. I can sort of choose more or less smoothing. Looks good. Grab some of these. Control drag. Put something over there. T. E. Control drag. Bring this over. Over. There we go. E. Control drag. T. There we go. Now, if we look at the volume builder, if I grab the smooth, let's see here. What's going on? Is it all being smoothed? All of the tree leaf parts? Just one. Why? Yes, right? So voxels, right? A voxel is a 3D pixel. So just like this, this window here, this is like Photoshop. These are layers. And so in Photoshop, if you make an adjustment layer, right, it only applies to the stuff underneath it. If you put something above it, it everything evaluates down the list, right? And so if I want all of this stuff to be smoothed, I need to move the smooth back up to the top so that it smooths all of the things like that. Now, when I adjust the smooth, everything gets smoothed. Cool. So the reason why I got discombobulated is because I was just sort of freewheeling here and um, control dragging. But when I control dragged, it didn't necessarily keep it in the same part of that hierarchy. And so something to keep in mind that after you're done sort of doing your creation, you may need to come back in and um, sort some things out so that you have the smooth at the top. There's another cool thing here now where there's this radius. And if you turn this. Nope, I guess it's not going to do anything. Why is it not doing anything? Child radius is in here. Yeah, yeah. Nope, I thought I understood how that worked, but I don't. So don't worry about it right now. Um, cool, we got that. Cool, and again, we put it inside of our <laughs> remesh, which is here. Ah, excellent, right? Great. Um, now, time to combine this uh, with our other techniques. And so this will be the trunk, and this will be the leaves. But now, I'm going to want to put maybe a trunk texture on this, and I'm going to want to put maybe some leaf textures on the leaves up here, at least something different. And so um, I'm going to need to do my connect objects. There you go. I'm going to need to do the connect objects. There we go. I'm going to group my originals, just like we did, so I can turn them off. Alt G. This is a original tree. Turn those red. And now on my tree trunk, this anchor point is good. I don't think I need to adjust that. Uh, the leaves, yeah, that's fine. I mean, everything's going to move together here. In fact, it probably makes sense to make the leaves a child of the trunk, like so. And now, um, in order to apply textures to this, what node do I need to bring in here? My automatic UV node. So I'll put it underneath both things. 
because I want them both to be automatically UV unwrapped. It looks good. And so now, uh, let's go ahead and export this. File, export selected object as FBX. Okay. And this is a uh, volume tree. Save. Come back over here. Mesh in here to here. Here. Great. Probably wanted to be a little bit bigger, maybe. So, volume tree, I'm going to make the default size two. There we go. Apply. There we go. That's a much more interesting looking tree than what we had before. And um, let's create some more subtle materials for this. Let's see what we, some of the options we have here. All right, let's see how this looks. We'll grab some bark. And again, 2K. Let's grab the diffuse ping. Did I grab the right one? Diffuse, here we go. And we'll grab the normal. Now, some of these textures look like they have stuff that sticks out in them. This is not going to happen in Unity in the settings that we have here. It requires a different sort of rendering setup for the material, just FYI. Um, Yeah, so we're doing more of a stylized look here. Just want something to give it a little bit of texture, and not just be flat green. So something, we're not trying to trick people into thinking they're leaves, we're just trying to give it a more sophisticated look. So I might go with this. Great. All right, let's see how this goes with the bark. The bark may be a little bit more problematic here in that we really want them to go in a specific direction. With our rocks, the directionality of the texture was not super important, right? Like what direction, like the just sort of evenness was what we're after. Let's see how it works with the bark here. Um, so let's go ahead and bring in what I just downloaded. And so the wall and the barks. And while we're at it, I'm going to grab the normal maps and tell Unity that they are normal maps so that that is correctly applied. 
and we'll map. Great, let's try the bark. I'm gonna come into materials and say create new material. Call this bark. And go double click on that. Let's bring in our base map. Not normal. There we go. And apply this over here. And yeah, so we're not getting any real weird stretching, but because of the nature of bark, it does have a real directionality to it, right? Where we expect the striations of the bark to sort of run in the directions of the limbs. And so that makes this a little bit strange here in this instance. And um, let's try to see if we can adjust this with our other shader. So with the bark, Instead of just using the regular shader, I'm gonna to go to shader graphs, the triplanar. I'm gonna to need to reconnect our textures. So it's gonna to have to go here, and then gonna to have to go there. And that isn't perfect, but it's pretty good. All right, especially given our situation here. And so our normal strength would be how strong this is, don't overdo this, right? Just a little bit goes a long way. And then our tiling here would be how big or tight is this pattern. And then our smoothness, probably turning that down, right? Looks weird, right? The, the texture kind of falls apart. If I tell it like, okay, this is a really shiny tree, the tree is going to be something much more dull. And then let's try the other one. And so under materials, create another new material. This will be stylized leaves. And let's bring in our textures. So I'll put this beige in our base map, in the normal, the normal map. And let's go ahead and turn this down. Let's go ahead and tint this. There we go. And put this up here. There we go. getting some seams and some stretching. So that's a surefire sign that we should go to our triplanar and bring this in and bring this in. There we go. You can see now much more evenly spread across the surface. And let's go in here sort of change the color of it. Something to draw to your attention here. Check out what happens when I move the tree. Uh, it's a limitation. So the texture is kind of fixed in three-dimensional space. And as I move the tree, you can see it looks fine when it's not moving. But if it moves, it's like, oh, that looks a little bit strange because it's the texture shifting. The texture is fixed and the geometry is shifting. Oh. And so Right, right. So for the for the, just the things where we're using the triplanar, we um, 
you know, don't use the triplanar on animated objects. Chowder? Like soup? No, like it's a first tone. Like, they have like textures for like the characters. But like the name is chowder like soup or no? No, it's characters like chowder, but. Oh, okay. Yeah, my two is this one, you know, they use textures to like put on the characters. So sometimes they move like the pictures just like stay in one place. Yeah, yeah. So there's. Um, I'll have to look. Last semester, this had not been addressed yet in Shader Graph. There might be an update where I can adjust this, but as of right now, don't use it on something that's going to move. So it just makes it as is. Cool. Now if I wanted to keep this together as one sort of thing, I'd take my volume trees and make them a child of the name. There we go. So now that would be one thing. Maybe this is over here. Let's get rid of our old, not so great looking trees, or at least less lower fidelity trees. Cool. So when it comes down to it, the key here is that um, pretty much almost all of the objects that you're going to bring in, you're going to want to apply the automatic UV. All right. Between that technique and using the triplanar shader where necessary, um, we're going to be able to apply textures to our objects in ways that uh, are going to work and be pretty flexible and look decent for, for our objects here. Automatic. Oh, it's weird. I must have clicked on something along the way and gotten rid of. This is strange. It doesn't show up there, but I can see it over here. Let's see if that happens. Got with those rocks. Oh, right, because they, that one's not moving. Right. 
I'll try and look for Wednesday, see if they've updated that node so I can update that shader. But for right now, that's our limitation. We put the um, rocks in there. So what we did before was um, we spun the whole playground, right? To get our slow look of everything, right? So in the slow in the playground, I use the animator here. I'm going to remove that. So we still want to get a view, 360 view of the playground. What would be the other option rather than spinning the playground? Exactly. Boom. Yeah, move the camera. Um, in this case, I, I usually think about these things like nodally, right? So we have the camera. Now we want the camera to go around, right? Um, I usually put a blank null object here. I make the camera a child of it. And so all I need to do is spin the object in the middle. So we can do that. I'll go ahead and say new empty. And this will call camera pivot. We will make sure it's at the center of our world, and it is. I'll take my camera, I'll make it a child of camera pivot. I'll take camera pivot and apply my slow rotate to camera pivot. There we go. I'll make sure that it is indeed slow, speed 0.1. And now if I hit play, let's see how that works. Something's fighting. Why would that be fighting? I got this slow rotate, slow scene. I took it, there's no spinning on the playground. The camera pivot is rotating, let's see. Let's see what the value is of our Z rotation over here. And turn off, maximize on play so I can see what I'm doing. The camera pivot is pivoting. The camera is there. Oh. It's because uh, the camera had this simple camera controller script on it. I'm going to turn that off. And we should be OK now. There we go. Why go through this trouble again? It, it, uh, the result here is the same, but it fixes our one issue of the texture changing when we moved the objects with the triplanar shader, right? Because before, I moved all the objects and kept the camera still. Now, all of those objects with the triplanar shader look fine because they don't move. The camera's moving. See the name and the rocks? No weird texture slippage anymore because they don't move. They're exactly just staying put. Now I've made my playground totally unsafe here. I've put the sharp rocks right at the bottom of the slide. May have to move that a little bit. But now everything looks good because it's in the right place. Let's get rid of our bad rocks. By bad rocks, I mean the ones with the texture that's not great. So this one is not great. Let's move this one because it's just, there we go. That's better. Probably don't want rocks right off the skateboard ramp either. That seems like maybe not a great idea. <laughs> Let's move this one. This one has the seam, so we don't want that one either. Oops, not that. This. And we'll make it two sets of swings. There we go. And now we've got some animation happening. 
don't know why I'm not seeing. I must have turned off the view and the. I'm not even sure what the shortcut is for that. We've got animation variety and we've got texture variety. Nice. Right, so fairly simple strategies. Brecken says, to be fair, which good part doesn't have dangerous rocks right next to the playground equipment? He has a good point, right? I mean, there's definitely an argument to be made about learning, right? You need to learn not to fall off the slide into the sharp rocks, right? Some people learn that lesson the hard way. Some people learn it the easy way, right? I'm going to put this tree over here. Maybe make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Yeah, I've got that nice animation. Cool. All right. So for for Wednesday, because Wednesday we're gonna uh, are we gonna do the whole project this week? Nope. We'll do this week on this project, right? So we'll be we'll be improving this this week we we'll, because we definitely need some more practice animating so as you have taken 184 with me or up to speed on that but i felt like there is some deficiencies in the approach to animation for some of the other students so we'll look at some other opportunities for animation on wednesday here to make our park a little bit more interesting and give us some more, um, yeah, visual interest. Maybe something on the ramp, something on the slide. We'll see. Sound good? OK. Cool. I'm going to answer a few questions here in person. If anyone else is on this chat besides Brecken, let me know if you have any other questions. Cool. You want to pull up your file? What did you forget? Um, I have this one little adapter for USB A to USB C. I keep forgetting to bring it because I'm going to get it to a student, but I just, I just slipped my mind. Like, as soon as I get home, if I remember, I can grab it. Because by the time the weekend passes, <laughs> or even the day passes, I've already lost the position.
ってないとすればいいんですね Oh, here. Okay. I didn't know this one. This eyeball here is to show it in scene. Because it was still showing up in the actual game, but I was like, where did it go? What is the shortcut for this? I don't think I pressed it on purpose. Click to toggle. Seems like there's not a shortcut. Did I just turn it back on? Shift H. Shift H is the hide. I guess Shift H for hide. Isolation view. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh, you can turn it on and off. Yeah. Uh, well, oh wait, what is this? This is because I can still uh, see it here if I. Ah, I see. Same. 